we are involved in a, in, in a series of, uh, of teachings right now that are exceedingly important because they deal with ourselves. You know, as long as you're dealing with theology, you know, it's out there. But when you start dealing in there, it gets really important. And because in there is what we want to change to be like Him, to be like the Most High. Uh, today's lesson is how do you cope with revenge? Now, revenge has, has been a, a power uh, <laughs> ever since there was mankind or humankind on the face of this earth. Uh, revenge is a natural situation of the human person without God. If you hit me, I hit you. And uh, uh, if you mistreat me, I'll wait for my moment to mistreat you. And, and so it is a, a very human thing uh, in, the, in, in the negative. When, you're, when you are uh, living by the devil's power, then it is a regular thing. Uh, how do you cope with revenge? Uh, what do you do about it? Uh, there have been feuds that have gone on for centuries. Uh, these rivalries are historic among nations, among families, among persons, saying, I'll get even with you. I'll get even with you. And the words which create revenge, hate, and murder, and, and all kinds of hurts that you bring into people's lives, they're the fruit of revenge. God tells us in Romans chapter 12 and verse 19, says, avenge not yourselves. Isn't that sweet? Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. That means push it aside. Uh, don't let it dominate you. Don't let it be the God of your life. It is written, God says, vengeance is mine. God takes care of wrongs. God moves people. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. When we think of revenge, what do we think of? It comes to us from a Latin word, vindicare. And uh, in our language, we have vindictive coming straight from the word. And uh, it means to inflict damage to another. It means to inflict injury to another or punishment to another. And we do this in return for some insult or, or some injury that we have received from that person or someone who is related to that person, either a friend or, or relative. Revenge means to retaliate with a bad spirit, with an angry spirit, with a hatey spirit. Uh, so when we retaliate with a vindictive spirit, we're taking revenge upon those that we don't like anymore. Our key point here, I think, would be, is there any satisfaction in revenge? Now, a person isn't very smart to keep doing things that don't help him and bless him. If you plant tomatoes, man, you got tomatoes on the table and they are good. If you plant revenge, what do you have on the table? You know? Uh, you do something nice to somebody and then they do something nice to you, you're planting and reaping. Well, in revenge, what do you get back when you plant? There's some evils in which there is some satisfaction, possibly. But in getting revenge, there is no satisfaction. It is a mental delusion. I'll hurt you, and I'll do it every time I can. I'll get my revenge. Revenge does does not satisfy thirst. You can't drink it. It doesn't satisfy hunger. You can't eat it. It won't clothe your body. It won't keep you warm on a cold day. There's no inward satisfaction 
to this thing called revenge. Revenge calls for more revenge. It doesn't stop anything. It calls for more from the other party. So revenge is a thing deep down inside of a human that cannot be satisfied. It is a growing cancer and it will destroy. And a person is not wise who takes revenge. It doesn't matter what has happened to you. What can revenge do to you, say in your mind or in your emotions? Revenge can make you act in an irrational manner. That you normally, with your regular IQ, wouldn't act that way. But when this revenge hits you, you start saying things and reducing your, and doing things that actually reduces your mentality. Now there's some things that increase your mentality. That put your IQ up on its highest level. Revenge is not one of those. It dulls the insides of you. All hate dulls the inside of you. <coughs> no person with hatred inside, no person with hatred inside can be at their best. You're not at your best with hate inside. Something's lost and something's down. And revenge is just as bad. It just reduces your insides to something you actually are not. In our world that we live in today, divorce is an example of revenge. You talk mean to me, I talk mean to you, then we go to divorce and get revenge on each other. One of the saddest things is when a man and a woman come into a courtroom and when they used to talk love to each other, they begin to downgrade each other. They begin to yell out loud at each other. When a few years before, they were all hugs and kisses. Are you here or not? They used to care for each other, and now they don't. And they want revenge. They want to hurt each other. I want to hurt you all I can. And there's some people around the country that wait for these situations to get what you've got cheap because they know you've gone nutty. They can buy your house cheap, they can buy your furniture cheap, they can buy your, you, they, they, know that, they know that you're not operating normally. And you're so angry with one another, you'll, you'll sell something you work for real hard at a big discount that's unreasonable. And they're standing, they are the vultures standing by to pick up the carrion of revenge. Revenge. It's a wicked thing. Revenge is often motivated by half-truths. That makes them bad. I don't believe revenge has ever functioned and operated in full truth. It's either half-truth or untruth that revenge operates in real strong. You did this, somebody told me you did this, and I'm going to do this to you. Revenge can cause acts that are so bitter that they leave a scar on your brain the rest of your life. That's a, that's a good reason to get rid of it. Revenge can scar your memory. And you drag that thing along by night and by day the rest of your life. Revenge can change the human personality from a good person to a mean person. And revenge does it. There's a person that's normally very good, very nice. And this demon of revenge gets inside. I'm going to get even with you. And that person starts doing things that are not the type of things that he would do if they were in their right mind. Don't let revenge ever change your personality from a nice person to an evil person. Revenge, I think, could very well be uh, illustrated as a cancer. Because a cancer is not like a little pimple that's going to come and go. Real cancer comes to stay. And it doesn't come to stay just what it is today. It's going to eat on you today. And it's going to chew you up inside. It's going to take your flesh and devour it. It is a living, it is a living cannibal. Eating your human flesh, gobbling it up. 
eating your carpuscles, doubling them up. That's what revenge can do for you. It can just eat up your insides until you become totally destroyed. You could put this in the, in the historical viewpoint of nations. There's some nations that have fought each other regularly, always getting revenge for the last war. Revenge can also produce a thing that I call ungratefulness and unthankfulness. It can't look up and say this good thing happened and that good thing. No, they've got to get revenge for something else. They can be eating T-bone steaks, growling about, I'm going to get even with you. <laughs> really, the two don't go together. Revenge can create an unthankful spirit inside of us for all the good things we've had and an ungrateful attitude. We've had a lot of good things. We're not praising God for them. Revenge causes sadness inside of you and the person that you, that you do it on. And it brings about satanic acts that dirty your hands and dirty your mouth and dirty your spirit. God does not want you to have a spirit of revenge. When the Lord said, avenge not yourselves. Give place to wrath. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. If we'd let God take care of a lot of our problems, he'd do it so well. He'd change people's lives and come some that you didn't love, you learn to love them. A historic act of revenge is found in Matthew chapter 14, uh, verse 3 to verse 11. It's a story of John the Baptist. He was beheaded. I mean, he got his head cut off through revenge. He had pointed his finger at King Herod, the Herod the teacher that only ruled one-fourth of the area that his father, Herod the Great, Herod the teacher and told him that it was wrong to steal his brother's wife. Now, stealing wives is not new. This story is 2,000 years old, and they were stealing them then. And the gals liked it. Isn't that amazing? She didn't have to go. She liked it. Philip was another brother that had a fourth of the kingdom. And, and uh, Herod went over to see him, saw his wife, and took her home with him. The queen became so angry inside of her that she said, I will get that preacher killed. So she dressed her daughter in very flimsy garments and had her to dance in front of the old drunken king. And he was so drunk, he said, I'll give you half my kingdom. That's what drunks will do. And she said to her mama, shall I take half the kingdom? The mama said, no, all I want is the head of John Baptist, the preacher. And she had him beheaded. Revenge. He had spoken publicly against her, and she said, so help me, I'll see that you die. And he died. Revenge. It has scarred history for 2,000 years. How does God feel about revenge in our hearts? Because there are people present that are possibly doing some deep thinking right now. God said, and this is great. You can read it in Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 25. God said that you are forgiven on the basis and the relationship in which you forgive others. That makes revenge a terrible thing in that you can't get saved with that in your heart. You see? You cannot harbor in your heart a desire to get even and expect God not to get even with you. I'm really glad God's not getting even with us. Man, I'm glad he's not getting even with me. Jesus said, and when you stand praying, forgive. If you have ought against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Whew. 
When you stand and say, God, forgive me, he says, you're going to forgive others? No! Well, you're not forgiven either. Jesus said, if a man take your coat, give him your cloak. Do not grab something from him. If any man will sue you in the law and take away your coat, give him a top coat also. I said, well, have, have some more. Bless God. You see? And, and so Jesus said, don't let revenge be in your hearts. Let God take care of revenge. He is the one that takes care. How many believe God can take care of things? Well, don't be taking care of them yourself then. In the Bible, if you'd like to make notes of this on your opposite page, in Numbers chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3, and also verse 16, Moses did not have to take revenge against his sister Miriam and his brother Aaron in their rebellion against him. They had mocked him and said two things. Who made you the only speaker that God speaks to? <laughs> God speaks to us too, you know, they were saying. And then they said, in that brunette you married, we don't like brunettes either. Well, I've got some good news for all of you. It's none of your business who people marry. If you don't believe it, stick around a while and you'll find out they make it none of your business. No matter whether you're a mom or a dad or an uncle or an aunt or whoever you are, little old stinky kids marry who they please. And who they please sometimes stinks too. <laughs> and all you can do is let them suffer. You can teach them their head falls off and they'll go right ahead and do it. I've lived so many generations I've found that out. God struck Miriam with leprosy because Moses didn't say anything. When they mocked him because of his wife, and that's a bad thing to mock a man for. And when they mocked him because of his leadership, Moses didn't say a word. God said, you three come up here. I want to see all three of you together. And when he got through with them, leprosy was upon Miriam all over her body. Now, her cohort, and this was her own older brother named Aaron, and he was a high priest and he was part, part of this conspiracy against Moses. And as the high priest, he was the one that had to remove his own sister Miriam into an isolation ward in the Sinai Desert. Are you here? Work together and God will see that you both get a full dose of it. She had mocked and he had mocked and one had to pronounce the judgment on the other because lepers could not stay with the other people, it was a very highly contagious disease at that time. And she was so important, the Bible says, that the children of Israel couldn't move while she was out there. You know, you can do some dirty little thing, and the whole neighborhood suffers along with you. They can't go anywhere because of you. And, and, and sometimes that way in a church. That one or two get rebellious, and the whole church just stands still. Can't go anywhere because of one or two. And that's the time you'd like to take revenge. God says, no, no, leave that up to me. I've seen God move a lot of people. Are you here? Moses prayed. Now, she could not get healed until Moses prayed. And he had to pray a good prayer. He had to pray a healing prayer. He couldn't say, Lord, bless this mean little sister I got. Always naughty and nasty. She couldn't have got healed on that basis. He had to say, oh, Jehovah, you are the mighty healer, and you can heal leprosy, and you will heal leprosy, and I command leprosy to leave my sister. And he began to get results. But you have to pray that in love. You have to pray that in forgiveness, you see. So Moses prayed, and her healing came to her. When he didn't take revenge, God did. If you leave God alone, he'll take care of some problems. How many believe that? Your next point, uh, not in your lesson. David did not take revenge against King Saul. In 1 Samuel 24 and 6, it tells us the story. Now Saul had tried to kill David. He threw a javelin at him to kill him, pin him to the wall. 
and he was playing music at the time. He hated him. He tried to track him down with a whole army. Imagine a whole army after one little fellow. And David was inside of a cave. And Saul, looking for him to kill him, came into the cave and laid down in the front of the cave, went to sleep, and David and his men were on the sides of the cave. His men said, kill him, kill him. If you're going to listen to people around you, you're always going to be wrong. You better listen to God. The people that love you the most will give you the worst information. The men that were for him said, now you got him, God gave him to you. No, he said, God didn't give me anything. He walked up and took a sharp sword and cut off a piece of his long coat. And when the king went out of the cave the next morning, David yelled at him and called him the anointed king. It was very beautiful the way he addressed him. Held up the piece of garment to let him know that he didn't touch him. And then in this, this verse here, it says, you don't touch God's anointed and you don't do his prophets any harm. You see, you don't touch God's anointed. So David refused revenge, and God gave him the kingdom. God gave him the, God gave him the kingdom soon enough. He was 30 years old. Well, that's young enough to start ruling a whole nation. And so God gave it to him soon enough. He didn't have to take revenge and say, I'll, I'll get myself into power. You don't have to get into power the wrong way. Uh, God can bring you into power the right way. How many believes that? The problem with revenge is that it's contagious. And it'll hurt you. You take revenge, it'll get into your children's hearts. And they'll get the same hate that you've got. And they'll hate the same people you hate. And you'll be amazed. You, you think you hadn't taught them anything and you listen to them speak and they're echoing your words. You say, hey, that sounds like me. Well, it is me. You see? And so it is a contagious thing. I believe it's contagious in a community. You can go from house to house and talk revenge until everybody there has got an arm ready to go out and start swinging. And I think the, that, that type of person would have to, you know, take more responsibility than a person that was just sucked into it. That you, you created this thing. In other people's lives. And your next point says, well, how do you cope with this thing then? Number one, you must realize that you do have a spirit of revenge. Most people, I don't have that, shoot him. I don't have that, kill her. Who you don't? Well, everybody else thinks you do. So the first thing to do is to realize that you do have within yourself a spirit of revenge. You're trying to get even with everybody. I'll get even with you. I'll get even with you. And you spend your whole life getting even with people. And that's an uneven road to travel. Some people go around their entire lives, all they do is getting even with people and they don't even know it. They spend their lives getting even and don't know it. Jesus came to forgive people that have done wrong. It don't matter what it is. Jesus did not come to call the righteous. He came to call sinners to repentance. So he, Jesus came to forgive all of us. So after you identify your needs, you look to help in the person of Jesus. You don't look to science and psychology and, because they can't deal with this thing. This thing's deep inside. It's got, it's got tendrils that run so deep that philosophy will never get it out of there. It takes an, an act of God it, it takes the mercies of God. It, it takes a miracle to get a thing out of us. And God's loaded with it. <laughs> He's got all you can stand. He's got miracle. He's got forgiveness. So we have to come to our source. To get forgiveness, we come to our source, and that source is God. An, extend, an outstanding example of coping was Jesus when he did not seek revenge for himself against those that murdered him. I mean, they were killing him. And Luke's Gospel, chapter 23, verse 34, on the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. They paid no attention to his prayer at all, you see. But he, he had no revenge. He didn't say, Father, kill them, kill them. <laughs> no. He said, Father, forgive them. 
So if they don't understand that I'm the Son of God, the Savior of the world, forgive them. Now that's the classic, you know, way to handle a problem. Say, Father, forgive them. Your last point, forgiveness is the answer. And if you can forgive, you'll have no spirit of revenge within you. If you forgive and forget, just like God, revenge will not be part of your life. In Hebrews 8 and 12, it says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Isn't that amazing? God is merciful to our unrighteousness. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Now, not only does God forgive, uh, God forgets, you know. He doesn't hold it against you. He doesn't say, hey, hey, 14 years ago, that's what you did. No, he forgets the whole thing. Now, that takes God to do that. And that's what God can put in your heart, that you can do that. And so revenge is a demonic thing. It's a satanic thing. And it's not divine. And it is never right. Never right. It's always wrong. Your case is not right. They're all wrong. It's right to forgive and to love. You see, I can't do that. No, we know that. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came to change our hearts, to change our lives, and to give us authority and power to do things we cannot do on our own. If you're glad for that, say amen.